All right, so to not cut too much into Don's time, I'll go ahead and get us kicked off here with an introduction. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Don Morton. Uh, the work he will be discussing with us today is part of a DTC project that he's been, a DTC visitor project that he's been working on. Uh, a little bit of history on Don. So back in 1986, as an enlisted person in the US Air Force, he discovered a deep passion to pursue an interdisciplinary mix of environmental sciences and computer science. And this led him to obtain his bachelor's degree in computer science from College of Great Falls in Montana. And then he went on to get a PhD in computer science with a minor in climatology at LSU in 1994. Following that, he had an academic career that led him to a number of universities, and he ultimately found himself at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. An association with the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center since 1993 kept him deeply involved in research and education activities in high performance computing. And a sabbatical in 2004 with the Missoula Mon in Mon Montana Weather Forecast Office led him to apply his interests in computational atmospheric sciences in collaboration with NCAR, the National Weather Service, NOAA, at the United Nations in Vienna, and other groups. So since 2016, Don has been self-employed um, as a computational scientist under the auspices of Boreal Scientific Computing in Fairbanks, Alaska. And he continues to pursue, pursue his dreams of improving our species through application of computational methods to environmental sciences. And so with that, um, I'll hand it over to you, Don, and, and thank you for your presentation today. Well, great. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, first, greetings from, from interior Alaska. It's about 10 degrees Fahrenheit above zero. Uh, we're just getting ready to drop down to a little below zero for the, the next week or two, which is pretty normal for us. So, um, yeah, as, as, as Jamie said, I've, I've been working on, on a visitor project with, with DTC for a little over a year and a half now. And, and so this presentation is kind of a report on my trials and tribulations um, as, as I pursued the project. Let me, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to start with and, and, and kind of just, just give you the, the quick overview and uh, um, and, and then I'll start digging into the details here. Um, the, the one of the, the primary goals that, that, that I've carried on for, for decades now is, um, is, is, is is trying to facilitate the rapid deployment of, of numerical weather prediction workflows, uh, custom workflows, uh, have them run when we need them. Uh, you know, we're not going to spend days trying to, to, to set them up. Um, but part of this this project here was was to leverage the DTC's extensive work in in the creation of Docker containers for NWP. And, and when I say NWP, um, I think of it generally, but in the context of this project, it's WARF, WPS and WARF. Um, so 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 they've um, developed these these Docker containers. And in, in one of my roles here was to see how we might uh, use them in the in the cloud, uh, specifically the Amazon cloud. Uh, I wanted to investigate the general feasibility of using cloud resources for modeling activities. And I think one of the specific deliverables is, uh, I, I just put in quotes here, was to create some low level client uh, command line interface tools that would allow users to create their own workflows. And uh, the, the vision here is, is they, um, they, they decide they want a workflow and, and they, they write a little bit of code and it just all goes out and executes on the cloud for them. Um, the, the methods here are, are primarily as, as I do with any complicated project, and this was one of them, is uh, try to simplify the heck out of it first and, and create analogs of, of these container-based services uh, just, just to see and try to build the plumbing to see how I could get them working in the cloud. I, I rely very heavily in complex projects on test-driven development, essentially uh, build, build the tests first as much as possible and then build the code to the test, so to speak. Um, and then, then ultimately the idea was to demonstrate the use of these services uh, to actually be able to create and run cloud-based workflows. And so, so the results in a nutshell was 
was was that they were much harder than I would have hoped, but it really wasn't a surprise. This uh, I've learned from experience, and I'm sure some of you have that that some of this can be pretty tough. Um, and uh, but but I was successful in in building and demonstrating these cloud-based services for a full workflow. Um, it ain't perfect, uh, but, uh, but but it's it's uh, I think a reasonable start. So so the outline of this presentation here is I'm, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time giving you the historical perspective and, and vision on on why I'm doing this. I I, I don't feel like I've, I've done that well enough in the past, and so you're going to be subjected to maybe a, a little extra. Um, I, I'm going to discuss the idealized vision of running numerical weather prediction workflows uh, in, in the cloud versus uh, the, the reality-based perspective, or at least reality as it is now. I'll go through some of the tedious implementation issues and then the, the obligatory summaries and, and closing thoughts here. So, so first, uh, I wanna give my many thanks to, to the, the entire DTC group and, and affiliates. This isn't the uh, first time I've, I've uh, worked with DTC, and, and as I've told them before, um, I guess the first time I worked there was about 11 years ago. Um, my involvement with DTC has been one of the highlights of my 30 plus year career. I've, I've always loved the atmosphere, the, the people, and, and, and so on. Um, so I'm going to start with, with the historical motivations, what, what led to this, this need to, to, to build these workflows in the cloud. And, um, I, I'm a computer scientist. I, I've been in 2004. I decided to go on on sabbatical and learn about weather modeling. I had just gotten my pilot's license, and I wanted to. I, I, I love bouncing around and understanding the weather. Um, and so, one of the the first things I did was was go down to Boulder for the the, uh, the last ever MM5 tutorial in January of 2004, where they told us, well, we're not doing MM5 anymore. Come back in June for the Wharf tutorial. So I did that too, and uh, and, and so I was able to to get my first Wharf running. It, it ran on a virtual PC that was running on a Windows XP. That, that was running on a one gigahertz Pentium at, at home. And you can probably see that I had some issues with boundary conditions. This is the Idaho panhandle. So I was kind of doing the uh, the Western Montana, the, their, their forecast area here. Um, but but it ran. Uh, and, and when I say operationally, I, it, it, it's not the traditional weather service, uh, meaning it, it just means that I was running regular forecasts. And so as part of the sabbatical, I, I worked with, with uh, Gene Petrescu, uh, who, who really loved getting into this kind of stuff. He was the Sioux at the time at Missoula. And, um, and, and so we, we got a, a forecast model running there regularly, the uh, Northern Rockies regional model or, or the norm. And, um, and that led me to doing the same thing up in Alaska because I had, had ties here. Uh, along the, the way, I've, I've helped do a, a number of research runs for, for a number of different research groups for different needs. I've um, delivered to uh, informal WARF tutorials for uh, mostly University of Alaska research students, National Weather Service people up here, because we had a supercomputer at the uh, Arctic Region Supercomputing Center. So it was in the context of helping them learn how to run things here. Um, and, uh, and one of the last things I did in academia was uh, uh, <laughs> we made the mistake of inviting Stan Benjamin and Joe Olson uh, up for, a, for a, a weather conference. And Stan says, you know, Don, you, you could prototype uh, an Alaska high resolution rapid refresh for us. And, uh, um, and at the time, it sounds like a good idea. And it actually was a lot of fun. So, so we ended up doing that. And to this day, I, I continue to set up WARF workflows. I, I'm doing it now for the United Nations um, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in, in Vienna, where we need to be able to model uh, the flow of radionuclides and stuff. So I've had a chance to make a number of observations, and, 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 and these are observations that have pretty much followed me from the beginning. They've just been reinforced over the years here. And, and one is that there are a lot of extremely talented R&D people out there who want to run WARF for custom purposes. And, and I've had them in my tutorials, and, and they get excited about learning how to do things. 
And two weeks after the tutorial, they're all busy. They've got their own things to do. And they come back to me and say, hey, Don, I kind of forgot everything. Can you help me set up a run here? And 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 so many of them, I'm, I'm going to the last point here now, are, are in this in, uh, scenario where, 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 where making Worf do what they want in their own environment, whatever com computational environment they have, ends up being pretty difficult. And so it ends up getting pushed on that list. And as the, uh, the great philosopher I met in 2010 at DTC, Randy Bullock, used to say, they, they end up putting it on that list of thousands of things they're going to do if, if they ever get the time. And so, it, so, so we have good atmospheric scientists, people who, who could make good use of the models, but they don't. And, uh, um, and finally, the, the other point here is, is when you do create operational workflows for people, they think it's great. And within 7.2 seconds, they start thinking, boy, you know, if you added this in and, you know, if you added some data simulation, and so all of a sudden they're talking about different workflows. And of course your heart's sinking because you just did all this work and, and, and you wish it was so easy just, just to uh, uh, readily adapt to their needs. So this is coupled with, with a career long vision that, that starts um, in, in the mid 1990s. I, I, I see Jeremy Sauer is, is in here. Uh, him and I go back 20 plus years to University of Montana where where we were exploring this, this idea of the computational grid. There, there was this, um, the, the Linux had, had just been out for a few years. The internet was coming alive and scientists were starting to say, you know, we should be able to use these resources easily. We should be able to access computational resources the same way we access electrical resources. We plug a lamp in and we don't care where the resources are coming from or, or how they're generated. We just get them. And so coupled with that was, was the idea that we should be able to run computer simulations. Who cares where, who cares how, just do it. And, and I liken it to the, the basic Star Trek paradigm, computer, do this. Um, along the way, I've, I've always favored in, in my teaching and such, uh, the, the paradigms of loosely coupled distributed processes. Some of you understand what the Unix way is. Unix is composed of a number of small modules that do things really well. And if you want to do more complex things, you plug and play, you put them together. And, and that kind of paradigm also leads into service-oriented architecture. As one colleague who um, um, sadly died a couple of years ago, used to say, um, the computers should be working for us rather than us working for the computers. And, and I'm not convinced, and I'm sure many of you would agree with me, that, that that's actually happening now. And so. Um, realizing this vision has been difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's been 30 years and, uh, and, and some people have done it. We can, we can run, we can watch a movie on Netflix and, and by, by asking our, our device to, to show it to us. And in that respect, it, it's ubiquitous. Uh, I, I can edit these slides here on within the cloud and, and not care where, where, where all the material is, but it just doesn't seem like we have to the best of my knowledge, done a, done a very good job of it in scientific computing and, uh, and, and, and particularly in numerical weather prediction. And, and, and it's my view that we should be able to do that. So I have a couple of, of scenarios here that, that, that always motivate me um, in, in this, um, th this vision here. And uh, uh, what one comes from, uh, discussions with, with Peter Webley, starting over 10 years ago at University of Alaska. Uh, he, he's, he's a volcano guy. And uh, um, we, we have a lot of volcanoes here in Alaska. We're, we're on the, uh, the ring of fire. And often when a volcano blows, it disrupts air traffic. And, and, and we, billions of dollars can be lost, uh, particularly when the volcano is over Iceland and, and Europe, as, as some people experienced a few years back. And um, uh, and, and, and so we would like to be able to, to come up with some better models so people don't have to close off entire regions and, and maybe we can allow flights to go through certain areas near the ash if we have enough confidence here. So the dream is to be able to launch an ensemble of, of forecasts and then um, Lagrangian particle um, dispersion models to, to, to get a feel for where things would go. And 
and and although the the volcano might give us some warning we don't necessarily know when it's going to go but when it does go we need to be able to generate all of this now and uh um and and, and we often well, we can't just have a bunch of equipment waiting for us and uh and, and maybe actually need it once every year or two years uh so so, so that's where the idea of the cloud can come in I, I refer to it as the pajama factor the idea that we should be able to just get wake up at 2 a.m and uh and, and uh set push a couple of buttons to have have all of these models go off and running so by the time we're out of our jammies and, and at work we we have a little bit of situational awareness the other motivation comes from uh emily niebuhr who i think some of you know she was in the uh complex terrain modeling uh group for, for a while she, she was um uh, with the weather service up up here in alaska and then she took a few years off and became the the first meteorologist at the UN World Food Program in, in Rome. And, uh, and and she contacted me and uh, I was still with the supercomputing center and, and she wanted to think about a project that would allow her to kind of do, do some on-demand high resolution uh, forecasts over regions of Africa. If, if the global models started to, to show that, that there might be some interesting activity happening then she wanted to be able to, to, to hone in on that region and, and, and launch a, a few model runs and, and maybe use that information to help stage resources before they were actually needed. And so you can en envision um, these kinds of problems being solved, or, or I can, by, by a, a plug, and, plug and play mentality here. And uh, this is just something I made out of the top of my head here. So suppose we want to, to, to run an ensemble of, of six forecasts. We, we want six different wind fields to figure out where volcanic ash is going to go. Well, we might realize that by, uh, by uh, initializing off of ECMWF and GFS. Um, and, and so we, we would have two different components right here. Uh, GeoGrid would be the same. Uh, the Met Grid, we could run these in parallel. We could run these, these different components in parallel here. And if we needed something a little different, well, we just move the components around. And of course, we we do this anyway. If, if you look in the WARF user's guide, I think the I have 4.9 is the most recent one. Uh, I assume it's still in there. Um, if, if you want to use the North American regional reanalysis, of course, we, we don't just do the straight, uh, the linear wharf run, as, as I like to re refer to it. We, uh, uh, we, we end up having to ungrib separate components. And so we can think of this in terms of components here that in this case, we could run them in parallel uh, and feed them to the other pieces. If we wanted some, if we wanted to introduce data assimilation well, we just add another component up here and feed it into to real and you know how we do that. And likewise, ECMWF has, has a kind of a complicated work workflow just, just to get things in. So if you're with me so far in, in, in this idea that, uh, th that, that components, uh, a component view of, of numerical weather prediction might, might be a good thing, we start to think about how how could we implement this in the cloud and specifically Amazon Cloud. I mean, not that I'm um, I'm hooked on Amazon. It's it's just what what I know and what most of us know now. Um, and um, and so so I'm going to kind of introduce you to the concept gradually here. And and so when I think about implementing this in AWS, is as much as possible. And and I know some of you are going to laugh here. Uh, I, I like to think of this very loosely as, as kind of a microservice paradigm here, where um, the Amazon is, is really well set up with, with, with Lambda functions and, and Fargate and such to, to be able to do something small very quickly. We might determine that we need a service, so we do something to start that service up in the cloud. It's, it's, it's a very quick startup here. We use the service, get our results, and then we shut down the service. And you know, maybe it's five thirty seconds, and, we, and we've we've got our results. And um, of course, when it comes to numerical weather prediction, it's not as simple. And so I kind of say, you know, microservices with a ha ha in there. It's not quite the same, but but I think it's a good paradigm to keep in mind. 
and 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 so so I, I try to play off of that. Um, in in this uh, AWS implementation, we recognize that uh, DTC has actually done a lot of the hard work uh, by packaging this this NWP code in, in Docker containers, and they're ready to go. And th they'll start up quickly. The containers themselves will start up quickly. The machines they run on may not. And 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 so they they've actually done a, a lot of the hard work in what my role has has been is to try to build the plumbing that hooks all of these things together, kind of like a, a microservice or a micro haha -ha service would. And so if, if we think of, of, of maybe a, a single component, in this case, we'll look at MetGrid in, in the cloud, um, it, it doesn't necessarily need a lot. You can envision us starting the component here. Um, it, it needs a name list. It needs to know what it's going to operate on. It needs to know where the ungrib files are. Uh, some we, we, we ass I assume they're in S3 somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but for efficiency, a cost and time efficiency, it's a good thing. It needs to know where the, where the GeoGrid files are. Um, a few other parameters, but, but tell tell the start the service up. Tell it where the stuff is at. Let it go to work and let it tell you where it it put the output. And so. Um, the next component here, the real uh, .exe service component, you could tell it where to find the, the MetGrid files and, and so on. And so how would we implement this? And, and so, so now I start thinking about RESTful services. And, you know, again, those of you who, who actually are serious about REST or are, 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 are shaking your head because there, there are purists when, when it comes to talking about REST. And, and, and I'm not one of them. I, I could be, but I can't afford to be in this context here. Um, and, but, but the paradigm, again, I think is, is very useful. And, and so, so I've been trying to play off of this. I, sometimes I fear that maybe I've been hanging too hard on this and, and forgetting other approaches, but, but uh, if so, that, that's the way it is. I'll, I'll learn. Um, so in, in a RESTful approach here, we've got a server that's, that's sitting out here. It could be a web server. This is a very simple one. It's just meant to so somebody sends a date in, in a, a city or, or a village, in, in your case, uh, and, and, and specifies a particular endpoint service temperature. And, uh, and, and it sends this request over HTTP. And uh, the server responds with something, hopefully. Um, and uh, and I actually looked this up. This is actually is the correct high and low for Netherland on May 14th, 2021. Uh, <laughs> the, um, so these tend to be short-lived operations. And, and, and that's a stumbling block when we start thinking about NWP. And, and, and I suggest that they're somewhat fault tolerant in the sense that even if something goes bad, you haven't really lost anything. Uh, you know, in, in one of the best cases, if something goes bad, your service will tell you in its response and programmatically you'll you'll figure out what to do. In the worst case, you know, you lose the connection, you just time out. And 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 with AWS, we can actually have, have a collection of these services running and and and, and just go for another one here. Um and and so. It's, I love the paradigm, and, and if you're starting to explore AWS in the implementation of services and thinking about, well, how would I do this with numerical weather prediction? Unfortunately, these are the kinds of examples you're going to find, the simple ones. And uh, numerical weather, uh, well, and before I go on to that, let me just uh, expand upon uh, how, how valuable I think this paradigm is here. So all of your response the request response transactions are done through HTTP. And ultimately this, uh, again, I'm, I'm not a purist here. I, I'm using this very loosely, but, but, but one of the goals here is to create a set of URIs. They're kind of like URLs um, uh, that, 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 um, that have well-defined behaviors such that if one of these applications uh, issues one of those URLs or, or, or UI, URIs, um, it goes off to the service and we know what we should get back here. And, and if we can define our entire workflow in terms of URIs, we can have anything work on it. Uh, we, we, can, we, we, we can think about having the iPhone. I think of Netflix. I mean, that's exactly what Netflix is doing. 
And so we can envision uh, a scenario where we, we um, say, computer, run this weather simulation. And Amazon provides the tools that allow us to convert the voice into um, restful uh, URIs and such. So if, if we think of this same paradigm in, in the context of numerical weather prediction, well, now we're doing a little more. And you know, this isn't an idealized representation where maybe I'm, I'm, I want to run MetGrid. And so I would pass in the name list and the location, uh, the, the S3 locations of the UnGrib and GeoGrid and a few other parameters, actually quite a few parameters that are AWS specific. And I would stick around and wait for my result uh, telling me where my stuff was located. And of course, it's it's not synchronous, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But 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 that's sort of the vision that I still have in mind. It just needs to uh, adapt a little or a lot. And and, and so if, if we take that vision, um, what I I like to call the, the holy grail implementation. You know, the, the way we would love it to work is if we could, if we wanted to run UnGrib, we simply uh, generate the correct URI, send it off into the cloud, and get our results. And when we're done with that, we, we do the same with MetGrid, Real, and Wharf here. And, and, and likewise, we, if, if we wanted to uh, do, do a, a similar thing with our North American regional reanalysis, you could envision a scenario where we need to process three sets of input files first, the, the atmospheric, the surface, and, and, and the fixed fields. And of course, we could issue these URIs in parallel. And, some, and when all three services were done, we could then run MetGrid by calling these services here. So, so that's kind of what, what a holy grail implementation would look like. But now we can start getting a little more toward, towards reality. And, and recognize that these services, of course, are resource intensive, sometimes incredibly resource intensive. And so we, it's not like we can just have a MetGrid service hanging out there waiting for us to call it. So, um, and and, and so, so we need a, a, a paradigm where we can launch a service, use the service, and then kill the service. And that's where that microservice ha-ha paradigm comes into play here. Um, but in this case, launching a service this big can take time. It can take a few minutes, um, which is okay in a number of scenarios, but, but it's something to recognize. And, and one of the things we know is that a lot of things can go wrong in, in a single um, implementation or, or instantiation of, of MetGrid. It may not be able to find the input files. We might have used a semicolon instead of a colon in the name list. We just wasted our whole whole service time. Um, things that you may not think about beforehand is 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 when we launch our service. One of the things we're doing is is we're creating a virtual machine out there of a certain size, certain amount of disk space, certain amount of memory. Well, what if we didn't uh, request enough? Well, the simulation's running along happily until all of a sudden it can't run along anymore, and we just we just lost it. And and then what do we do? We may get to the very end and, and realize that 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 it's it's unable to write the output to a bucket for for some particular reason, and then on top of all that, the um, we need to make sure that we do terminate the services, and and that's not necessarily easy. Now I, I know I saw David Hahn in here, and and he does make it easy in, in ways, and and in a way I hate him for that because he makes it look so easy. I'm just kidding, David. Um, and, and, and we've had talks on that. So, uh, just an, another side thing there. Um, so, so as we do this, I, I think I've, I've pretty much said these, these points here. Ultimately what we have is, is, is we launch an NWP service here. And unlike a typical restful service, we can't just wait around and wait around, uh, for possibly hours for, for a wharf.exe to run. Uh, we, you know we're going to lose the connection. So, so it's an asynchronous uh, kind of service here. And we know there's so much that can go wrong. Um, I, I liken it to shooting off a space probe. We, we shoot a space probe off to, to, to an asteroid and expect it to pick up some, some dirt and, and, and bring it back for, for, for analysis. 
And and the minute we've shot the space probe off, you know, we don't really know much except what it wants to tell us. And it can only tell us so much. And, and it starts to get scary. And, and I feel that same way when we launch a MetGrid service, all of a sudden it's kind of out of our control. There's so much going on out there. And uh, how do we know what's going on? We, we need some sort of communication link. And so, so, so this is actually where all the work is, is uh, at least on, on my part here. And, uh, and, and as I see it, we've got this remote process that's working somewhere out there. We, we don't necessarily care. It's an expensive resource. And yet we still want the simplicity of some kind of a, a REST-like environment. And, and so we, we need it to be robust. And so if, if um, th this is a graphical representation of, of on the left, the, the holy grail implementation where um, maybe we, we want to run MetGrid in, in the cloud here. And so we've uh, in the holy grail version, we've got a device that can, can generate a URI with all the parameters, uh, API gateway in, in Amazon will feed it to uh, to, to some logic that, that we make available that will ultimately launch this MetGrid service as that component that I showed you in previous slides. It will know where the ungrib and the geogrid files are, and it will ultimately generate MetGrid files. And um, but 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 again, what we've done is from our client, we've shot that space probe off into the cloud. And we don't have a great idea of what's going on out there. And, 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 and again, although someone like David Hahn has, has done some of this, um, I'm not 100% convinced he's satisfied all my worries. And we, can, we, we have talked about it and we can talk about it more. Um, so I've ended up, at, at least for the time being, pulling this logic outside. And so what I envision is, is a local workstation doesn't need to have much on it, uh, running uh, Python backend drivers and clients, and those will, um, will, 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 will do what needs to be done to launch this MetGrid service in the cloud. So, so the implementation looks kind of like this. I guess I should explain a little bit. This, this whole outer box is, um, is, is a, um, is essentially a, a Docker-like task, a, a elastic container service. And it's this particular task in, in AWS stores three containers that are related and, and can interact with each other. And, and the primary ones I'm going to talk about here, we're looking at GeoGrid now, is, is an NWP service container. So that might be MetGrid or, or GeoGrid in this case and a web service container that, that I happen to, to put in there that I'll explain a little more in a minute here. And so the strategy here is, is that we, we have a client out here that, that launches all of this, or it sets the command that will launch this stuff in the cloud. And the NWP container's purpose is fairly simple. Remember the Unix way, we don't want these components doing too much and you know, running GeoGrid is a lot. Um, and so its primary purpose in life is one, and, and most important, is to maintain a, a standardized status log, something that a web service container could actually look at and query and, 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 and understand what's going on here. So, so, so the first thing it does is start a status log, and, and it gets updated with, with each key event here. Um, then, of course, uh, we need to fetch the needed inputs, the, the ungrib. Uh, well, actually, GeoGrid just, just needs some, some uh, geog files from, from uh, the other container here. We set up and run it, and then we stage the output file to an S3 location. So it, it runs the simulation, and it, and it does a status log. The, the web service has a read-only access to the run directory in the container. And, and, and that's one of the beauties of being able to use these containers and um, especially the NWP service one that DTC has, has done most of the, the construction of and doing these all within a task here. I can run a simple web service in here that has read-only access to the run directory, which also has these status logs that are being created. And, and, and so its sole purpose in life is to answer queries about, well, what's going on in there? I've shot the space probe off. 
This is my communication link. And so the client, after launching this in, in, in kind of a synchronous way, it launches it, uh, it's non-blocking. Um, the only, it, it's, it's like the space probe took off. Now the only connection we have with this process here is through the web service. It's that communication link with the space probe. We can query the communication service to, to look at the status log. We can query it to, to, to look at certain aspects of the run directory and, and at least get a feel for, for what's going on in there. Um, the containers themselves, uh, I'll just say a little bit about those if, if you um, have played around with Docker. Um, the, the NWP service container primarily is already created here. It's, it's available on Docker Hub uh, uh, from, from, from DT Center. This uh, isn't the version of Wharf. It's, uh, it's, it's their version of, of the container, if, if I remember correctly, because I'm using 4.1. Um, and, and so on top of their container, I, I simply add a couple of things here. Th these are um, packages, Python interface to AWS and a command line interface to AWS. And, and this is for processing JSON uh, queries here. Um, and then I've got my own Python programs here for each of the services here. And, uh, and that's it. I, I simply add all that stuff in and I've got a, a container here for the MWP service. And the, the web service is similar, except that's completely mine. Uh, it's just a simple CentOS 7.7 .7 running uh, a Cherry Pie web service. It's, if you've done Flask before, it's, it's kind of the, the same idea. It's a very simple web service, but it does the trick. And I've uh, got, a, got a web service for each possible NWP service here. And so um, just another look at, at the service here in, in, in context is, is, is that on, on the, we assume we have a client that has launched this stuff, it's off and running. We have no direct contact with this, um, this NWP service and we don't want that. We, we want simplicity here. This thing is supposed to just run a wharf simulation. We, we don't wanna go in and control it and have, ha have it make a lot of intelligent decisions. And, and it just gets to be a headache to maintain. So we, we let it do what it does best. And then we let the web server at least tell us what's going on here. We can query it um, on, on, on a port here. And we've got an, enough endpoints here that we can get some information on, on what's going on here. And um, so from the perspective of the client, which, which is running on, on a local workstation, uh, we would have a Python program that understands where the input data is located. Uh, and, and, and we assume they're in S3. It would ensure that um the where we want to put the output data is specified and that it's ready I and mean, we want to do as much as possible before we actually launch the space probes uh but we we need to take our name list which we are assuming is perfect for now um and uh and and um uh, put it in an s3 location so that we can tell the service where to get it and then we start the service again where we, we shoot the probe off um, there's a, a lot of um, AWS specific stuff going on here to, to, to get this, this task with two or three containers in it. And, um, it, but as, as soon as we, we, we start it, we, we can run the ungrib service. And so within that NWP container uh, from the outside, we are telling it when it's ready to, to run this Python program I created with a various set of arguments. Uh, do what you do best, just run Ungrib the best way you know how, uh, the way you were taught in a tutorial, and, and put your output in this particular location here. And then from the perspective of the client, we're going to periodically pull the web service for status updates. And, and of course, these are synchronous operations. It's just boom, get the result, boom, back. And, uh, and, and this is just a, a set of, of sample queries to, to the web service. And so, for example, um, uh, th this was done locally. This, uh, this example just comes from some tests I was doing. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we can uh, create the, the URI for that web service and specify the status log. 
and it's designed to return the entire status log, which is a list of dictionary entries. Each entry has, most importantly, the task that it's working on, in this case, setting up ungrib a pre-check, and its status. And then eventually we see a success for ungrib pre-check, and, and, and we start staging the, the MET files, the meteorological files that, that are going to be ungribbed. And, and when we're done, we, we end up with uh, where we have staged our ungrib files, and, and that is, is complete. Uh, th there are other uh, endpoints here. I, I kept it fairly simple. But one of the important things at the end here is we can check. Uh, we can query our web service. So, so even when the NWP service is done and that container is no longer functional, uh, we can still access that run directory as, as long as the web service is running, uh, that volume is still alive. And so we can uh, check the ungrid files, which is something that a client would probably want to do and see what got produced. And again, these are just testings. I just threw some test files in there to, to test it. So, okay, a, a broader view of, of all of this, just a, a different angle, is we've got this, this local workstation, or, or I've actually just been doing all of this in a virtual machine on, on, on my, my own computer. Um, to do what we've seen on the previous slide, it doesn't really need to have, it doesn't even need to have Docker on it. The Docker is, is for development purposes, but to use it, what you really need is just the AWS tools here, and, uh, and, and Python, of course. Uh, there's an API that we'll look at in a little more detail in a couple of minutes here. Um, ultimately, it's, uh, it will make calls into this API, which will result in this ECS cluster being formed out in AWS, which means we launch an EC2 instance and we start the containers and such. Uh, one of those is the NWP service container. One is the web service container, which which um, the API can then communicate with to see, hey, how are things going out there in, uh, on Mars? Uh, fr from kind of a software stack perspective, what we're looking at here above the dash line, again, is, is that workstation, that local workstation uh, view here, where we've got a client API for, for every one of the services. I've, I've just got kind of a comprehensive um, class that will handle all of the tedious details of starting a geogrid service in 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 the cloud here and, and 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 handling the communication back and forth and then on top of that as you'll see in a few minutes we we've got some uh some some basic python programs that uh that, that simply run these the, the workflow so to speak and then of course in aws we have our elastic container service, a task with, with the various components that we might need. Just a quick time check here, Don. You have about 15 minutes left. Okay. I think I will we'll make it, um, but uh, I'll, I'll go a little quicker here. Thank you. Um, so, so let me back up here. Um, I'm going to start looking at, at one of these Python programs that, that actually drive everything. And, um, and, and this is sort of uh, no frills, no error checking. Everything's going to work perfectly. We don't need to communicate with anybody. We just do it. Um, and uh, uh, so, so we include uh, the, the correct module here. We need to specify the, the, where the Docker images are, uh, somewhere in Docker Hub, a lot of other specifications uh, that, 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 that could get abstracted away. Um, ultimately, we, we create a, a GeoGrid task object here. Um, this is on the client side still telling AWS uh, well, what kinds of things we want to, to this service to listen to. We, we need it to know where to get a name list, where uh, various input and output are going to be, and, and some of the uh, um, AWS technical issues here. Um, we do a lot in here, a lot of checking in here because if things are going to quit and, 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 and crap out, you want them to do so early before you've actually launched a bunch of stuff. So, so this does a lot of checking. Um, and if it passes that, then we actually start to, to set up the, that ECS task. We, we start up a virtual machine and such. We can start a run. This becomes asynchronous. We've started the run. 
now we can monitor it until complete. And when it's finally complete, we can get the output information. And of course, we need to clean up. Uh, so when we run it, uh, just a couple of highlights uh, from, from our, our Nothing Will Go Wrong launcher here. Uh, some of the things we, we see are, are we, we have to have AWS credentials to do this. Um, th that's not part of the Holy Grail uh, vision, but, but it's part of the real world vision. Uh, check for Docker images and such. Um, ultimately, uh, let me back. No, I need to keep going here. So, 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 so now we get to the point where uh, we've passed the first muster and, and, and we're ready to try to launch our EC2 instances. And notice the timestamp here and here. It takes a little over three minutes just to get this all started, which again is okay under certain conditions, but, but it's something to be aware of. And then we can start the run. Um, as it's running, we we probe it uh, over and over again. We see GeoGrid run is it's it's running. We're finally at the complete stage, and one of, and and we looked for the information on the output. We get the size of the files. Very importantly, we get where those output files are located, so that a client could then use this information to drive the next stage. And so the stuff ends up uh, where we would expect in uh, in, in a uh, in an S3 bucket as as objects. So um, uh, I'll skip over this again. This this was just a repeat for a a review, and I'll, I'll go through these quickly within that GeoGrid task. Uh, just some of the things that we need to think about as we are launching this GeoGrid service in the cloud. Um, we, need to, um, we need to check AWS credentials. We need to look at the name list and come up with an estimate for how much memory and disk space we're gonna need so that we can select the right kind of, of resources in AWS. Um, and, we, and, and, and then what we need to make sure that the, an EC2 instance is going to support all of that. We need to ensure that S3 resources are accessible uh, we don't want to just dive in, shoot the probe off, and hope it's all going to work. We need to check all of this stuff, and 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 so on. So ultimately, we 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 set up the the cluster. Um, we then start the cluster. It takes a while, and and we have to wait for it. And this is one of those things we do, and then we have to keep polling until it's actually operational, and 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 it's been successful. We do the same thing with the run. And, uh, and, and once it's running, uh, the probe is out there and all we can do is, is wait for it to finish, uh, but we can monitor as it's going along. And what, what's going on in this uh, monitor until complete is that we're simply, um, this, this is some of the code that would do that is, is we're calling this URL over and over latest status and uh, we're checking the status here, and 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 if the task is output stage and it's complete, then everything's good. If it's failed, then then we know as a client, and we need to do something else. And uh, when we are done successfully, as I showed you before, we we can understand where the output, uh, what we got for output, and most importantly, where it is. Um, I'll skip over a, a more robust GeoGrid launcher essentially just has us um, uh, uh, putting things within try, accept, and, and, and there's a lot of debugging tools here to get more information. And, and I'll skip over th this one here. I feel like Jeff Domago now. I, I, I learned from him on how to present lots of slides. And, uh, um, it, it, we, we can do a full workflow now. And, 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 and this is what, what's been happening recently is, is is, is we can uh, um, can start uh, have a single Python program that that launches ungrib and then metgrid and so on and ultimately when we're all done we've got our wharf out files we've got where they are in S3 their sizes and then we could uh, could, could call a, a visualization routine to look at them or post processing uh, lots of testing going on in here it, it, it's it's the only way to to survive uh, I, I these are obviously long running tests, um, but I, I, I tend to set them up with unit tests, even if they're going to run for five minutes. I've just found it's, uh, it's, it's very useful for, for checking things. There's actually, this is an old slide. It's more like 150 
um, tests right now. And, and this has saved my butt many a time and, and it needs to be run now and then. It takes about 30 minutes because we're testing stuff, uh, uh, real world processes in AWS. I'm creating a user oriented how to. Um, and uh, I, I think I should have that done in, in a week or so. And, and I'm providing with that a, um, a virtual box image of, of a client that will work, even though there's not much in it. And, and trying to guide the user through how they would set this up and do some simple workflows. It's, it's not meant to be a tutorial on, on how to get an AWS account and set it up, but, but it is meant to at least kind of help you through the process. Okay, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, starting to, to wind this up now. Functionally, it does work as as designed, uh, as, as, as I've, I've shown you here. The um, We have to recognize that a typical workflow is gonna take a long time. You know, the disadvantage of this, do ungrib as a service, do metgrid as a service, is each one of them has to be powered up um, before executing. And for, for short runs, that's, that, that really shows up. For longer runs, it's, it's obviously a, a smaller slice of, of the total time here. Again, we have to recognize that so many things can go wrong in a service. We need to make sure that, um, th that we not only catch them, but that things are cleaned up correctly because people are paying for these resources. Um, using containers. Um, has, is, is probably one of the few viable options to do something like that. I know David um, ha, has, has been using EC2 instances, and, and that's just another approach. But I, I think having these ready-made containers for NWP has helped a lot. There's lots of unexpected problems with AWS, particularly in synchronization. And they might be um, specific to Boto3. I, I haven't fully explored that yet, but for example, you, you think you're copying a file into a container from S3 and you, and it, and it's done and, and you think it's like a Unix copy, but it's not always done. And, and, and that can cause problems. Um, am I happy? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I think the vision had to be realized. Um, it's, uh, very high complexity. Um, when you think about it, 20 years ago, doing something like this would have been miraculous. So, so I am happy that we've been able to do this, but I'm still nervous because of uh, all the complexity involved. Uh, future directions are, are ultimately managing the complexity. I, I actually, at this point, want to step back and, and, and rethink everything. You know, I, I, once I got started, I really didn't have the luxury of just backing off and taking other paths here. So I want to reevaluate this. I want to consider cloud portability. I don't like being locked into a vendor um, and expand to other NWP processes and data. Um, I'll skip over this. Some of the activities we've, we've done here uh, or I've done as part of the project is, is meeting with the DTC container group. Um, I had exploratory meeting with, with David Hahn and, and Jeremy Sauer from the Fast Eddie group who have some interest in this. And again, Jeremy and I go back 20 plus years. Uh, so it's kind of fun catching up with him. Uh, in this virtual world, I've been able to do a few presentations, uh, uh, a couple already, a couple coming up. And finally, the, my regrets is that I never made it to Boulder for a site visit here. We, uh, uh, we're starting the planning for May, early May of, of 2020, and I was looking forward to it, and uh, and obviously that didn't work out. So I, um, as much as I love being a recluse here in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, it, it it would be good to come down and, and see you all. And, and again, I I I love the time I've spent at DTC, and uh, hopefully someday I'll make it down there again. Okay, that's where I'll leave off. Great, thanks so much, Don. Yeah, we're sorry to not have been able to host you this time around. It is quite unfortunate, but yeah, for all your work and for sharing with us um, a lot of the complexities of what you've been trying to do. Um, so I, I just wanna, with the last few minutes here, open it up to questions. If people would like to unmute and ask their question, go ahead and raise your hand and mm -hmm. then we can call you in order. Um, if you don't have a microphone accessible, um, feel free to use the chat and post a question there, and I can also read it off.
Chris, please go ahead. Should I be looking for a chat here? Or? Hopefully he's able to come off mute now. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> I was wondering if how you were able to deal with uh, performance issues related to per parallel execution. Typically, good performance requires elastic fabric adapter on AWS, which is, from my understanding, only comes with parallel cluster. I was curious um, if that was something you were worried about. Um, at this point, no. It, it's obviously a very important issue, but uh, um, you know, when I'm just trying to get the workflow going, uh, the the actual performance is is, is sort of a peripheral issue. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I have I, I have played around with parallel computing in, in EC2 instances and and um, gotten at, at least respectable speed ups, like I don't know, maybe up to 48. Uh, tasks and and so on. So I, uh, I I've always assumed that that's something that that I or somebody else could could resolve in the future. Did you run Warp in parallel in the container across multiple nodes? No, no. That that would get very difficult. You know, we we can go up to well. Last I checked, 128 nodes. And, you know, in in the past before this project, I actually worked with the uh, the CFN cluster. Um, and, and, and the group at University of Washington, I think it's Cliff Mass uh, group, um, had actually built a nice infrastructure for running WARF across nodes and such. Um, and, but, but that didn't really fit this paradigm of containers. So um, it, it's possible. And um, I don't quite know how I would get to that point right now. It's, it's uh, to quote the great philosopher Randy Bullock, it's on my list of thousands of things to do if I find the time. Brian, go ahead, please. Hi, Don. Uh, really nice talk. Thank you. I, I was uh, just curious. We're doing something similar with uh, CESM, but I'm curious if you've looked at a centralized API that, say, like NCAR or somebody else could run to handle these sorts of requests rather than asking people to launch microservices, letting them just launch their workflows. Um, I thought about it, but but the problem is somebody has to pay for it, and somebody has to pay for all the mistakes. And you know, you, you and I are going to look, you know, clean up our our mistakes, but uh, uh, you know, not not everybody is going to. So, yeah, it's I I, I don't like this. I, I and it's not even restful. The whole idea is somebody should be able to just throw these URIs out and have the stuff done for them. That's the holy grail look. But I'm far from that. Or no. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any um, any contact with the uh, National Science Foundation EarthCube um, Cyber Infrastructure Group. I know that at one time there was some discussion about create uh, supporting these kinds of workflows and developing APIs for um, easily being able to do scientific discovery and um, and model running models. Any any progress on on their end? Um, I, I'm peripherally aware of what they're they're doing, but I'm actually I'm not in academics anymore, um, and and so so I've actually and I've made contact with them. I, I I can't get in the funding stream or anything, and so I haven't paid that much attention to them. Right. Thanks. Uh oh. <laughs> Jeremy, go ahead. Oh God! Good this morning. Back. So good to see you. Back. <laughs> it's been a long time. It's great to hear your voice again in in a talk. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, just following on with a question regarding: uh, Would you anticipate possible extensions to this workflow, where you may getting back your S three of results have other REST APIs that support analysis or oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I think if I just go back a slide or two here, um, uh, you know, originally, you know, th this is one of my failures here. Originally, uh, this is going to be implemented in in the data simulation, the the post processing, the uh, the the verification and graphics production, and uh, and and yeah, I'm it, plug and play. That that's really what what I would like to do. 
Um, I, yeah, I'm a little hesitant to jump into that now because I, again, I'm, I'm happy and I'm not happy. I, I feel like I need to jump, step back and reevaluate what's been done. And, you know, again, talk with, with David too, see what, um, if, if, if there's some ways we can both clean each other's messes up, so to speak. And, um, uh, and, and once we have have a paradigm that I think is is good, start extending it to some of these other areas. But but yeah, that's that's the whole idea is you build a new component and and just just add it in. Well, I'll say fast eddy might be another component someday for yeah essentially yeah. downscaling or, or or nested simulation. Yeah, so looking yeah. forward to it. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate your presentation today. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And, and if anybody else has any follow-up questions they'd like to ask and you need Don's contact information, don't hesitate to reach out to me. We'll make sure that you have that. Um, and Or you, you know, obviously feel free to contact him directly as well. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you so much, Don. Again, I really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining. Okay. Have a great winter, everybody. <laughs>